your facilitator. My name Sorry is Dr. That. Glenda Clare. It's okay. I'm Dr. Glenda Clare. I am the facilitator of this session. And guess what? Although y'all have your pictures down and your mics off right now, well, two of you do, three of you do, I'm going to ask you to introduce yourselves. And I'm going to start with Eileen and definitely not Carolyn, because Carolyn is not Carolyn. So <laughs> Carolyn, can you let us know who you are? Okay, um, the jig is up. Um, I'm not Carolyn. I'm actually Carolyn's son, um, Jeremy, and I'm a presenter with SPAN. And pretty much I am here today um, as kind of technical assistance. If there's any issues with anyone's, um, any, anyone's like audio or video or any kind of internet issues, it's gonna be my little job to um, make sure all that gets fixed. And ideally, um, I won't have to do anything, but if something does go wrong today, y'all can just count on me to uh, get it straightened out. Great. Eileen, we'll let you go next. Thank you, Dr. Claire. Yes, my name is Eileen Terrain. I am a sustainability coordinator for Paxis Institute in Ohio, but we are a national and international organization. I am here today to help with the chat box and any questions that you may have. If something comes up that you'd like to comment on or share a question for Dr. Claire, uh, please go ahead and put it in the chat box and then I will help to address those those questions and comments as they come through. If you'd like to have the question brought to me privately, that's fine as well, but to everyone, and then we can move toward Dr. Claire works also, whichever you prefer. Thank you so much. And definitely ask her the questions because when I put up my slides, I cannot see anything. Gina, I know Gina, she's from North Carolina. Gina, share who you are. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Gina Brown. I am a parent partner um, specifically for uh, child welfare. Um, enjoyed uh, years working with, um, with Dr. Claire and look forward to information from this session and the other sessions um, with this presentation. Awesome. Eula Lee, you're next. And Eula, you know, I've got to tell you that I love this name of yours. And that is because your name is the same as my grandmother that I never met. And so she died before, before I was born, but I love this name. Please tell us who you are. Well, hello everyone. I'm Eula Lee Whitaker. I'm from Memphis, Tennessee, and I'm a lead family coordinator for a Chevy Connect Network program, which is part of the system of care, which I get a chance to work with a lot of families, and a lot of them is in the generation of families that I work with. So this just really hit the core when I saw this was going to be a training, so I'm looking forward to it. Great. Glad to have you. Marge, who are you? Marge, you've got to Marge unmute yourself. Marge is off right now. She's taking a potty break. <laughs> okay, Pam, we'll let you we'll let you go, Pam. Okay, I'm Pam Waterman, and I work for Ask Family Services in Kalamazoo County in Kalamazoo, Michigan. Nice. I see Deborah just came on. Deborah, tell us about who you are. My name is Deborah DePue, and I work for Oregon Family Support Network in Eugene, Oregon. Lane County as a peer support specialist. Awesome, awesome. I think that's Kathy. Is that Kathy? Kathy, who are you? Hi, I am Kathy Bornhop. I am the parent support partner supervisor in St. Charles County, Missouri, and in Lincoln County, Missouri, with the partnership with families program through Compass Health and Fact. Awesome. And Mandy, who are you? I am a parent support partner with FACT um, in the Franklin and St. Charles County. Okay. Millie, did you come back? No, Millie is not Millie. Millie is Marge, isn't she? No, Millie yeah. is Millie. Hi. Hi. Tell us who you are. My name is Mildred Tenio. I'm with the Family Support Organization of Passaic County. I've been a family support partner for a little over a year. It's rewarding work. It's hard, but it's rewarding work. <laughs> That's great to hear. That's great to hear. Now, who has not 
shared who they are. Cheryl, I, I, I just saw your name come up, so we don't know who you are. Cheryl? Okay, well, we'll Cheryl, we'll talk to us later then. I'm going to go ahead and pull up my PowerPoint slide. I'm here. Oh, good. Tell us who you are. Hi, uh, I'm Cheryl. My name is Cheryl. I'm in the, um, I'm in Michigan. Michigan. Mm -hmm. Oh, there's a couple of y'all that are in cold areas. Like Eileen is up in Wisconsin. You're in Michigan. Uh, Cheryl, did you go? You did go, right? Did I go? Did you tell us who you were? No, that's me now. Is it two Cheryls? It's me. I'm speaking now, Cheryl. I'm in Michigan. I, I'm going to tell you, people's faces are hopping on my um on my computer so you were in the lower right corner and now you're in the middle so it's like okay sorry so i apologize that's okay that. that's okay mm -hmm. okay well it's good to see everyone i'm gonna my go problem. ahead and and pull up my powerpoint slide hold on wait a minute i just did something interesting so i need to readjust but i'm getting ready to pull up my powerpoint slide and then we can go ahead and get started now i'm going to tell y'all that um, some of what we're discussing today is still uh, in the creation stage. And that is because uh, grand families, although they're not new, they are new in a sense in terms of this population. And so Gina Brown, who spoke earlier, and I are actually in the phase of creating. And so going to share some really great information with you, but also going to pick your brains so you can keep your mics on because we're going to be having this. Um, this is going to be interactive. Um, I do want you to know, however, that if you start having weird sounds, dogs barking, all kinds of things happening, please mute yourself. But I do want you to be involved in this um, discussion because that's what it will be. Um, I am going to give you a lot of information, but I also want to talk with you as we are developing this program. So this program is called Adversity is Not Destiny, Intergenerational Grand Family Peer Support. And that is because we are developing peer support, parent peer support that is specific to grand families. So let me take you to my next slide if my computer will go there. Okay, computer. Okay, my computer decided to go, yay. So here's what I want you to know. Nearly 3 million American children under the age of 18 are members of a grand family. Now, how many of you, raise your hand, if you have, are familiar with that term, grand family? Had you ever heard that before? No, I'm seeing people say no. Um, most people, when they think of this population, they think of kinship care. However, I'm going to tell you in just a little bit some information that may make you want to use this term grand family the way I'm presenting it. So a grand family is created when a grandparent or other relative, other family member raises the child of a relative unable or unwilling to um, parent for whatever reason. Sometimes we're not able to parent. And I'll tell you some of those reasons in a little while, but sometimes that doesn't happen. And so if you know what I know, you know that not being there for whatever reason creates a hole in a child's heart. Children hurt because of that. That's traumatic um, when their parents aren't there. And so that causes adversity. But I do want you to know that it, adversity does not have to mean destiny because when grand families are supported, wonderful things can happen and children can thrive. And so I wanna talk about grand families, what they are, why they are, and I want you to work with me as we think through what it means to provide grand family peer support. 
Okay, so the objectives of this training, I'm gonna talk about the characteristics of grand families. I'm gonna list reasons why uh, children and youth live in a grand family. I'm gonna to describe to you kind of what I think are needed in terms of services for grand families. And then I'm gonna um, talk about specialized grand families for specialized populations, African-Americans, Latinos, Native Americans, okay? So the grand family, as I said, a grand family is created when a, when a grandparent, because grandparents are usually the first ones to step up, when a grandparent or other family member raises the child of a relative unable or unwilling to parent. Lot of children being raised with another relative in their household. Look at the numbers in terms of um, children being raised. There's 7 million, um, close to 8 million, being raised with just a relative in the household. However, look at the significant number of children being raised in a family with just the relative, no parent present. <clears throat> a lot of kids. Now, here's the thing that I want you to know. This is the reason why I prefer the term grand family to kinship care. When most people think of kinship care, they think of child welfare. Child welfare is the first thing that comes into the mind. They say, oh, um, that child must be in the foster care system. However, that's not the reality. The reality is in the United States, for every 20 children that are living with a relative, only one of them is in the foster care system. I live in the state of North Carolina. Here's what that means here. In North Carolina, for every 29 children living with a relative, only one of them is in the foster care system. It's part of the kinship care system. It's part of child welfare. And so in North Carolina, that means that those 28 children don't get any resources. They don't get any help with health care. They don't get any um, help with food. They don't get any help with respite. They don't get any help with anything. And so it's hard on those families especially when those families are grandparents, older grandparents that maybe aren't working anymore. Maybe they're living in a retirement center. Lots of things, lots of issues to look at. More information. Now, I mentioned to you earlier that most of the relatives that have their relatives' children living with them are grandparents. And so here's the numbers. 33.2% of them, there's no parent present, no birth parent present. Most of them are under 60. Most of them are in the workforce. 21% are impoverished. 24.9% have a disability and 29, well, close to 30% are unmarried. Now. These stats are from the old census. These stats are pre-COVID. Really important to notice. What do we know often about people who have become unemployed during COVID? We know that a lot of older people are unemployed. Um, we know that people that um, have poverty levels may have lost their jobs and lost their housing. There's a lot of issues that are coming up in, in terms of COVID for these families. So let me tell you about why children come to live in a grand family. And actually, you know what, um, Eileen, let's, let, let's do something fun here. I want y'all to list in the chat reasons why you think that children and youth come to live with their relatives' children. 
their relatives, um, their relatives. Um, can y'all put that in the chat? Everybody write something down in chat. I want to see oh, what here we come. come Lot huh? again. Thank you all. Divorce, substance use, mental health, parents unable to care for their kids, substance use disorder, abuse, parents are unfit. Lots of really important things happening here. Death of parents. The parents are not able to physically take care of them. Death, incarceration. Um, Ill, I think uh, we, we've got um, immigration, I believe is what, uh, uh, immigration, drugs, incarceration, low income, poverty in birth family, domestic violence, parents unable emotionally. Uh, Gwen says, my grandson was removed because my daughter was using drugs. I adopted later. Wow. The court determines it is best. That was from uh, C. Rather. Substance abuse, death, physical limitations, mental health issues. Some parents just can't overwhelmed with responsibility, neglect, one parent unable to pay child support, a couple more coming in here to keep them out of the child protection system, death, disability, drugs, mental health, interge intergenerational trauma, finances, emotional, immature parents, domestic violence. Oh, everyone's very involved here. Parents, incarceration, two more parents, too young, and homelessness. Okay, so I y'all are y'all are good. I'm gonna give y'all that. Y'all are good. I have um created a list that I call the 10 D's. And the 10 D's include many of what you all are saying. So I'm gonna tell you what my 10 D's are. Number one, my first 10 D is death. People, of course, that's how my cousin came to live with me. Her grandmother died. She came to live with me because her, her grandmother died. Dr. Claire, we had one more, if I may interrupt, sorry about mm -hmm. that. Uh, and it, I think this relates to what you're what you're saying as well. Multiple situations that override the main reason. And then uh, Cheryl Calloway also added that she forgot to add incarceration. Incarceration, okay. Mm -hmm. So those are gonna come in, only I'm using D, remember. So death, deficiency. So for, for me, deficiency is the parent is lacking or not doing something well. And so the child is at risk for removal because of that. Deployment, military deployment, um, desertion. The parent just disappears. Um, I don't know if y'all have no, Gina knows that I've been looking into Jamie Foxx's history. Jamie Foxx, his parents just deserted him. Um, and so that was a reason. D, the um, fourth one that I have is detention. Detention is incarceration in jail or prison. Five, I have deportation. That's really relevant now in terms of a lot of families being deported. Disability, physical or um, mental disability. Distraction. How many of you know of um, younger parents who maybe needed to go back to school or needed to go to get a job or something? And so they kind of left their children with um, a parent or another relative. Divorce, I don't think I heard anybody mention divorce, but divorce should be on that list. Drug abuse, y'all said drug abuse, I heard substance abuse, that kind of a thing. And then my number 10 is domestic violence. If I had to pick the top three issues in terms of children going to live with relatives, I would put drug abuse on that list. I would put detention on that list. And I would put domestic violence on that list. Now, these issues are not maybe so big for us as adults. But when we're looking at children, oh my goodness, those are our big issues. I was recently talking to a family that was going through divorce and they were saying, well, you know, this is just between mom and dad. We're, you know, the ones being divorced and I had to give them a bigger picture. You're their whole world. You're your children's whole world. They don't know nothing without y'all. And so if you're not there, their whole world shatters. And so there's significant trauma when that happens. It hurts, it's painful. Let's look at 
um, ACE scores, how many of you are familiar with adverse childhood experiences? Okay, so if you know anything about adverse childhood experiences, you know that they come in three categories, abuse, neglect, and household disruption. Those were the original 10. I'll tell you there are more than 10 now, but um, those are the original 10. And so just looking at this list, can you see where um, those 10 Ds that I mentioned, can you see where they're, where they're falling? Just Talk looking clear. Yes. Uh, just to add back, many people are definitely aware of uh, ACEs. Someone, uh, Beth Schmidt is actually a trainer. And I wanted to back up because Doretta Brookins also shared something so important that said it takes a village. It does take a village. It does take a village. We're going to talk a little bit about that village in just a minute. <laughs> we'll talk a little bit more about that village. But I just want to give you the framework in terms of why this is important for these children in particular. Now, what I know about um, family partners, parent partners, is that typically we are looking at childhood and mental health issues among our children, our children, the ones that we gave birth to. We don't look so much at the children that are living with their relatives. And I wanna give us more focus to that community because there's a lot of work that needs to be done with that community. So this is one of my favorite graphics. <clears throat> It's one of my favorite graphics because it shares that when grand families are supported, children thrive. And I'm gonna say that again. When grand families are supported, supported, the children thrive. Grand families are not always supported. But when they are supported, the outcomes are awesome. Relatives are more likely than people that have no connection with these children to stick in there with them, to hang in there with them, to try to keep <clears throat> them together with family. And that's because they are family. They are family. And I don't know, I, I think I said it, but I need to make it clear now. This population is important to me because I am one of them. I went to my aunt's funeral, hadn't seen her in years, actually living, lived in a completely different state. I'm from New York state, but I live in North Carolina now. I went to a funeral, I went to my aunt's funeral, my father's sister's funeral. And you know, I, I was just going to the funeral to pay my respects. There was no way that anybody could have told me that I was gonna be coming home with, with a child. I went to the funeral. My cousin, the child's mother was there. And I saw some strange things happening at the funeral. And I was like, I, I don't understand, who are these people? Why, why are they here? Child welfare was there at the funeral. And I kind of overheard that if somebody didn't step up, the children were going to go into um, foster care. And I did say children. So my aunt, my paternal aunt had my biological second cousin, but she had also adopted two other children. And so, oh we had to figure out what was going to happen because those children were family too. You know, they grew up, they had been with her since she was, since they were babies. So they were family too. We had to figure out, okay, what's going to happen? Only two of us stepped up. But here's what we know. Remember what I just said? I said, yeah, they weren't biologically connected, but those two boys, they were family too because she had adopted them. And my first cousin who I took, who came to live with me, she thought of them as her siblings. Family is more likely 
to keep siblings connected. Yeah, we made sacrifices. We were making telephone calls. We were driving up and down the road because, you know, we had this person's birthday and that person's birthday and, you know, graduations and what have you. We needed to be there. Family does that. Cultural identity. Did I know about the culture of my cousin? Yep. I could look in my photograph albums and get pictures of her mama. I could do that. I could tell her stories about her mother and her grandmother. I wasn't so, I didn't know so much about her because I was out of town, but I could give her rich history that she needed because how many of us um, don't know the story of grandma, you know, or what somebody did, you know, or have pictures of, of different things and could go back, you know, everybody right now, a lot of people, not everybody, but a lot of people are into that ancestry.com and what have you. I could give important information. A stranger can't do that. Another thing, remember I said, that's my cousin, that's my family. I'm gonna let her know that she belongs automatically because she's part of me. So when you have family involved, children don't have to worry about whether or not they belong. They don't have to worry about their culture. They don't have to worry that this person is gonna stick it out because you know what? That's what families do. We're gonna stick it out in the good times and in the bad times. We're gonna figure this stuff out. We are, we're gonna do this. And so if you can get family to be involved and if you can support family, you're going to have a child that is going to be better adjusted. You're going to have a child that's probably gonna have a higher self-esteem. You're going to have a child that knows where they come from and, and all of that. You know, the basic things that you need to have to move forward in life. That child is going to know those things. And so it is very important. It's urgent that we support families. Now here's the deal. I got introduced to Dr. Glenda Clare. Yeah, I'm Dr. Glenda Clare. But I was just as clueless as everybody else was when it came to my cousin coming and living with me. You know, like I'm used to dealing with um, some behavioral health and mental health issues in a 50 minute hour. I had a rude awakening. My cousin came to live with me 24 <laughs> seven. I was single. I hadn't raised chick nor child. Information about the school system. I want y'all to know, I, I have a new respect for parents. I have a new respect for teachers. Cause when we had, no, when my cousin came to live with me, right? One of the first things that I recognized, well, or it came to recognize me was that I had to find some place for her to be because I had to drive to work every day and her school didn't start before my drive needed to start. And then at the end of the day, I still had to be at work. And so I had to figure out what to do about that. In my particular case, my child came from New York and I lived in Virginia. The school system, although I had all of the paperwork from the court, and here's the thing, most families don't have any paperwork from the court because they didn't go to court. I went to court and got legal guardianship. Most families haven't done that, okay? But when I got back to Virginia, which is where I was living at the time, the school said, um, 
well, we have to have a hearing. I said, you have to have a hearing. Hearing about what? And they said about whether or not she can come to, to school here. And I said, of course she has. She can come to school here. She's living with me. She, here's my paper. <laughs> and they were like, no, we have to have a hearing. And I was like, and so what am I supposed to do? What am I supposed to do if you decide not to do this? There's a lot of stuff. Now, if I had been older, a senior citizen and living in a senior's community, the people in the community could have said, oh no, we have no children living here. And I would have said, I, I, I live here and, and my relative Charlotte's come live with me. And they would have said, sorry, benefits cut. All kinds of things happen. There are things that we need to be there to support these families because they don't know these things. They don't know these things. The IEPs that you all know about. Did I know about an IEP? Well, yeah, I knew a little bit about an IEP, but I didn't, I didn't really have to know but so much because I was generally the counselor come in to talk about somebody else's case. And the school counselors and the school social workers knew about the IEPs and the 504 plans and all of that. I didn't know all of that. These families don't know about this. If it's grandma, if it's grandma, her children are grown. She don't know nothing about this. Dr. Claire, may I interrupt for a moment, please? Yes. We've had some wonderful comments come through. Please share them, share them, share them, share them. Thank you. We'll start with Cheryl Calloway, who also started uh, about eight minutes ago, said she is also an ACES trainer. Thank you, Cheryl. And also there was a, a thing, there was my, this is from Darcy Kella. My parents supported my children and I after a divorce with my spouse. We moved from Los Angeles to Hawaii. Cheryl Calloway also added, in my role as a parent support partner, over the years I have worked with and supported many grand families. I currently have two on my caseload. And from Jill Richardson, uh, so beautiful, she said, you give me the chills. Amani Badi shared, this is, your words are so true and she misses her grandmother. And Dorena uh, Brookins mentioned that she has to uh, go to a court. Uh, uh, she will be back in a little bit. Uh, if we are still on Zoom, Doretta, we hope uh, that she can join us again. Rose said she agreed our heritage, when you re referenced heritage, our heritage is so important. It is good to know where you are going, but also to know where you come from. And C. Rather shared, please let me say, I love you. Thank you. A, cu Thank a couple you. more quick ones. Tammy Matthews, yes, I have had families that have happened to, they have lost uh, their senior living and home. Uh, Sonia Brown says, this is on point. Yolanda shared, I myself have basically raised my 15 year old grandson, be at uh, my daughter in and out of prison here in, in Connecticut. She came home June, 2019. Once she came home, this young man uh, had trouble so many times yesterday after being, so this is just yesterday after being in detention for a month, he went to a therapeutic program. I never went to court for guardianship during all of her incarceration. When he is released in six months, he will come to live with me permanently exclamation point my network support system will help me to accomplish this another two more exclamation points Kalila says my mother raised us 10 and then three grandsons until she literally collapsed at the age of 70 and finally with Rhonda Bullock uh, mentioned that she has 27 families half of them are grand families half of them are grand families okay so y'all can relate to what I'm talking about in terms of support and why it's important. Now I need to go down. Wait a minute, somebody's got her hand up. Millie had her hand up. You know, I was raised by my grandparents. My, I suffered the, your typical immigration mm. thing. My father immigrated when I was four years old from the Dominican Republic. We were well off and eventually I think it was it me or my brother we got sick where we almost lost our kidneys wow. and we had to go live with our grandparents 
my mom, she, at that point, she became a single mom. She had to provide. So she became a nurse and would work 72 hours straight through because the shortage of nurses was so little in that part that they didn't have any coverage. Mm -hmm. And when she would come, you know, it's like she was, she was there, but she wasn't there. You know, she was exhausted. So I'm like, as far as like grandparents go, I have like the utmost respect because it takes a lot. It, it does. It's a, like I've seen both sides of the spectrum and I'm like, wow. Well, I'm getting ready to tell y'all another part. Yeah. So hold on. <laughs> so <clears throat> I have this Facebook page called It Takes More Than Love. And that is because it does take more than love. Now, the issues that I showed you on the other page about why grand families need to be supported was one level. Now I need to go to another level. How many of you, um, and I'm going to ask for you to um, say yes or no in the chat, but how many of you are those relatives that raised a relative's child? If you're one of those, put yes in the chat. We're hitting six, seven, eight, nine, ten yeses. So thus far, the yeses keep coming. And there have been some no's also. One, two, three yeses, one no, four yes, five yes, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Okay, so I want to focus eight. on the yeses. Okay, the yeses. When you step in to raise your relative's child, birth parents not in the household, the whole dynamic of the family changes. The dynamics change. When a grandparent raises his or her grandchild, that child comes on the same level as the parent because they are the children. Now they are the children of the grandparent. When I, as a cousin, came in and raised my cousin's child, so here's my cousin, I came up a notch above her because I'm raising her child. Now, let's think about this. You are the birth parent and this relative of yours is coming in and raising your child. Do you have some feelings about that? Do you think there could be some anger some jealousy, some guilt. There could be some appreciation too, but do you think those other emotions come up? Okay, that's birth parent. The person who has stepped up to raise their relative's child, do you have some anger? Do you sometimes feel like well, but I'm the grandparent or I'm the cousin or I'm the aunt and uncle. I'm raising, where, where is that parent? Do you think that some of those feelings come up? And in terms of the child, well, I listen to you, but that's my mother or that's my father. Lots of what I call emotional traps are there. And there is a need to deal with those issues. The families can work well if they get some assistance, but there's probably gonna need to be some assistance. And generally we don't talk about these needs. We don't talk about even having a need to do these things, but we need to. 
I'm going to come back to that one. Because right now, I'm going to have y'all kind of talk to me about parent peer supportive services. And at this point, I'm actually going to turn off um, the PowerPoint for just a minute. I'll get back to it. But I'm going to turn it off for just a minute because I want to see y'all as we talking. So I'm going to turn this off. Dr. Claire, would you like to hear some more of the comments at this point? Yes, Wait, I can hear some of those comments as well, I'm turning off the PowerPoint. Thank can you. I say something real quick? Can you guys hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, you can't see me. My name is Amy Young, and I'm with Maryland Coalition of Families. And the reason you can't see me is I'm actually in my car driving to pick up my grandson, whom I have custody of. And I wanted to speak before he gets in the vehicle because there's things that I don't really want him to hear at this age, at the age of five. And everything that you were talking about in regards to the emotions and the anger is, is point one in regards to, I am angry with his parents, not because I have this beautiful, perfect child in my life, but I'm angry with his parents because they could not figure out how to make the sacrifices in order to be able to raise him. Um, I have sought counseling for myself in order to work through that anger. Um, I've also sought counseling on how to address his questions when he asks about his biological parents and how to address them age appropriately. Um, neither parent have really been in his life and he's five years old for three and a half to four years. And those questions come fast and furious. They do identify with their biological parents, whether or not they've ever seen them or met them. And that was one thing that the counselor explained to me. Um, my thought process is, is exactly everything you're saying. Get a support system. Surround yourself with other grandparents or aunts or uncles that are doing the same thing that you're doing so you can share war stories you can share what you're doing in your household that's working what you've tried with your grand that is working and um it 100 does take a village it's 100 percent. when my daughter that lived in a different state found out that cps told us it was us or a foster family she moved back and she moved in with us for a year and a half to help with this child um i'm just so glad that there's so much support out there and I just wanted to share my story before my little guy got in the car. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you for sharing your story. I think that that was very relevant I, and I'm glad that you did that. So I'm going to throw out to you. So we're here at this conference. My expectation that is that the people that are at this conference are people that are familiar with family peer support parent um, peer support. That's who you all are, correct? So tell me about the services that you provide. What kind of services do you all provide? And I got my notepad out here because I'm, I'm taking notes. What kind of services do y'all provide? Unmute yourselves so y'all can I'll, talk. I'll go first. My okay. name is Rhonda Bullock. I'm with Maryland Coalition of Families. And it's interesting that this came up because what I do for my grandparents, I don't do for, you know, my other parents. So for instance, I had a grandmother who recently got custody. So I literally will do a Zoom with her. We got online to the school district's website. I registered, I had to show her how to save a document, how to scan it, how to upload it to the school's support. And it's interesting, I have about 27 families and about half of them are grand families. And I think I bring an interesting perspective because I was raised by my grandparents and very old school grandparents. Um, and again, I also do this work. My, both my parents had mental health issues. And so I, I think I bring a good perspective because a lot of my grandparents have a very old school way of viewing things, even as far as mental illness, as far as discipline. And um, I don't believe you can't teach old dog new tricks because what I find is that grandparents are very willing to change just if they have tools, especially with discipline. Like, let's be real. A lot of these grandparents, they want to spank. They want to do, you know, some of that cruel and unusual 
um, punishment. And so what I find is um, the resources that I would normally do for a regular, not a, you know, a regular family, just as far as going to IEP meetings and offering that emotional support, I find with my grandparents, I do a little bit more. They need a lot more handholding. It's because they, you know, most of them didn't plan for this. They were planning to retire, go on vacation. And now a lot of them say, well, I raised such and such kids and they never did this. And now they had these kids with um, emotional health issues. And um, prior to this, they wouldn't look at it as a valid diagnosis is, you know, they would just look at it, well, this child just needs discipline. And I find that with my grandparents, the more I offer a little bit more of support and getting them to see that there can be a different way to raise children and you can still be as effective. Good job. I like that. I wrote lots of notes related to that. What I'm hearing from you is, um, and you know what, I'm going to ask y'all, those of you that have your cameras on, to raise your hand if your caseload does have grand families in it. Looks like just about everybody is raising their hands saying that they got grand families in there. And how many of you are also people with lived experience as a, in a grand family? And actually, I'm going to ask you two things, women. Put your hands down. So the first question that I'm going to ask you, and Gina, you don't have to change your picture because you know I know all your business anyway. Now I'm just playing with y'all. I do know um, her her issues. So if you have been a grand, if you have been the person that has raised a relative's child, raise your hand. Wow, lots of y'all. If you have been the person that has been raised by a relative, raise your hand. Okay, good. Interesting. This is good to see. So um, since, yeah, see, Gina's got her thumb up. She's done both. She was raised by her grandparents and she raised a rel She raised her um, her, her ex-husband's children um, and grandchildren. Um, so what I heard was a couple of different things. And I'm going to ask for thumbs up or thumbs. No, I'm going to just ask for thumbs up if you agree. So um, in terms of sharing information about discipline, um, more you know, going away from old school, um, different styles of discipline. If you think that that's an issue for your grand families, raise your thumb up. Okay, in terms of understanding mental health issues, um, that there is a need to teach them more so that they have more understanding of mental health issues, thumb up. Okay. Um, in terms of their willingness to learn new things, is that a yes or a no? So thumbs up if you think it's a yes, thumbs down if you think, no, not working. Okay, thumbs up. Oh, okay, got you, Tammy. We're going both ways here. Um, the computer skills, is that an issue? Yes. That's an issue. It's a okay, huge one. so I want to hear from others. What are the other issues? Yes. Well, there, there's, we have a very involved group here. There's so many good, comments. Good. Yes, tell us. Thank you. So we'll start at 306. Uh, Eula Lee started with, this is Eula. I raised my nephew and niece after my sister died. Beth Schmidt shared, my spouse's daughter just moved back home with her four daughters. The generational lack of communication and lack of coping skills is very challenging. Kalila says, oh yes, God bless grand families. And Steven Sluter started saying that there is a bill moving slowly through the Tennessee legislature to pay relative caregivers, such as grandparents, aunts, uncles, etc., like they are for foster parents. So that's good news in Tennessee. Tennessee. Uh, yes, yes. Uh, lots of yeses. And then we have um, uh, Terry Montgomery shares with her beautiful niece. And Tammy Matthew says, I raised most of my cousins. We have Kay McGee, McGee, excuse me, saying, not me, but several of the families I work with are grand families, half a dozen, and one or two aunts. We have Tammy Matthews saying, my, grandfa my grandmother died, and most of my aunts and uncles were on drugs or had mental illness, and I was a teen raising all of their children. 
Um, C. Rather says, I raised my grandniece while her mother got it together. It took three years. During that time, I raised both of them. Tammy Matthews says, in our families, looking for help was taboo. Millie shared, yes, even now it's taboo. Thank you, Millie. And Darcy Kila shares, yes, while my parents raised Black Hawaiian grandchildren and Hawaiian Korean, and it was a major difference. The ethnicity was different upbringing. Margie Williams shared, I've adopted two grandsons and I'm recently fostering two others. Millie shares, I am woman and hear me roar. <laughs> However, <laughs> I'm a firm believer that just because you have a reproductive system does not mean that you are meant to be a parent. Gwen Honeycutt shares, along with that, there is guilt for me as a grandma, adoptive parent. I felt guilty for several years as a failure as a parent because my daughter couldn't get it together. Thank you for sharing. Um, Rebecca Bryant shares navigation of community services. Yolanda Stinson shares, I feel as a failure with how I raised my daughter, even though I know that the choice has always been hers. Thank you for sharing. Uh, Rebecca Bryant shares self-care support groups. Robin Nelson shares care management, CFTSS and HCBS services, as well as OMH family support. Rebecca Bryant shares targeted case management. Tammy Matthews shares anything from educational support. I'm a certified doula, also a grief support specialist navigating community supports. And Rebecca Bryant shares referrals for mental health needs. Trudy O'Brien shares aloha all. I think we have, um, there, there's quite a bit more. Uh, would you like me to go on? Would you like to continue? So I'm, gonna, I'm gonna stop for just a second and I'm going to ask a question. A lot has been listed. I've, I've just heard a lot of stuff. And most of the things that I've heard are pretty much directed towards the children. Now, <clears throat> I've got to share with y'all this bias thing that I got. Okay. How many of you have ever taken a flight on an airplane? Have you been there during the first part of the flight where they do all of these instructions and tell you to put on that oxygen mask? Mm -hmm. And if you got somebody else with you that can't do this, you take your oxygen first and then you give them some. But you got to take yours first. So I got to say, but my cousin came to live with me in 2003. She was nine, getting ready to be nine. When she came to live with me, she's 26 years old now. <laughs> <laughs> Yay! Okay. Epic. <laughs> <laughs> but my hair has died. <laughs> if I took the dye out, you would see that I would be completely white here. Um, the experiences that I had, and yes, I know, she, she had trauma, but I had some too, <laughs> especially after dealing with her and her mama, okay? I understand. And, and, and as I do more of this work, I, I truly do understand that people who are hurting hurt people. Mm -hmm. But those of us that stepped up, left whatever we were doing in our life, those vacations we planned to go on, those things that we enjoy doing that we can't do some things when you have children. I mean, you, you just can't, you know, like I want to go, you know, on a girl's trip. Well, what am I supposed to do with my child? Like, she can't go with me. Or it's not a girl's trip if I take her with me, right? I do believe that there is a need for us to work with the heads of these grand families to do some self-care pieces. And so I'm going to ask you, how do you help them to do that self-care piece? Because typically, and I know I'm guilty, I have people tell me, oh, no, you can't, you need to have some time for yourself, Glenda. And I was like, no, I have a child. I'm a parent. I have to do this. I have to do that. I have to do this. How do you work 
with these grand families, these heads of these grand families, to get them to take care of self. Because here's the thing, if they're not there, the children, if they're not already in foster care, they're going somewhere, okay? Um, as well as the hypertension that a lot of these heads of households get, um, other health conditions that are not good, high stress, and also, most importantly, I think in retrospect, how I treat myself teaches you, the child, how you need to treat yourself in terms of self-care. So what are some of the things that we need to tell these heads of grand families? And I, you see, I got my notepad. This is Eula. Yes, um, you. I'm in Memphis, Tennessee, and I work with quite a few of the family I work with are grand families. And basically I tell them just what you just said, that you have to take care of yourself. That's the first thing I talk to them about. Self-care is so important because I've been there. I let them know that if you don't take care of you, you won't be here to take care of them. And they're going to end up in the system or somewhere else. And I help them develop their own support system. I had to form mine. And they village. I helped them, you know, you, I'm going to help you form your village. And trust the people who will help you, give you a respite. It don't have to be overnight because a lot of the grand family don't believe in overnight visits. I didn't believe in it. But if they can give them a respite for after school for two hours, during this, this, during that time, you do something for you. I try to help them understand it's okay the dish you don't get washed at three o'clock. I said, three o'clock is that's your time. You take a time, it ain't nothing but a bubble bath. Uh, it ain't nothing but a walk. We do, I do support group. If you're afraid to go for a walk, I'll come walk with you. And if some of them I have done it, you know, I just take them by the hand. We're going to do this together till you can do it on your own. And you just tell them. I make sure that I tell them. When the last time you went to the doctor? Because when I'm working with them, I want to know it's, it's, it's not just about the youth. It's about you, too. I need to know about your health. When the last time you went to the doctor? You need some appointment. When you go, while you're making the appointment for the chairman, when you going to make your appointment? Because a lot of time we put ourselves on the back burner. And I really stress to them the importance of self-care. And so far it worked. And they really appreciate it. I let them know my phone ring all the time. But I tell them, after nine, don't call because I'm not answering. But it's beginning at six. If you need to call me, call me. You, we can talk. And, and we do this. And sometimes they just need someone to listen. And that's how I, I do. I just listen. But I think it's so important that they take care of themselves. That's, that's a key issue. And you just help them. Because I know when I started my journey with this, the program we, we got now, they weren't in Shelby County. Shelby County in Tennessee is, is a county almost unique to its own. And when I reached out for help, there was, there was no help out there. So I had to form my own village. I was blessed because my maternal side, which my sister, my relative them used to give them every summer for me. And I tell you, I used to live for the summer. They used to either go to Knoxville, Tennessee, or my brother and sister would fly them to California. But that was my mental health break. And I just believe every parent, every caregiver need a mental health break in order to do it without Getting so you get so angry that be displaced anger on the term because you angry at something else. Because parenting has been one of the most difficult jobs I ever had to do. Okay. Wow, a lot shared there. To somebody else? Wait a minute, I, I see Stephen up there. He's saying, yeah. Stephen, let's hear from you. Because you you know, you seem to be the only male in the group. And you know, we need to hear that male perspective. Well, I was liking what she was saying. I was joining the chorus um, that you got to take care of yourself. I think what I try to do with people is I know every family is different to start out as what, 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 should, what would you like to do to take care of yourself? Or what does that look like for you? And sort of build an image, help somebody. And then I kind of try to remember that and try to help them create it. 
even if it's in just metaphor or, or but they know what they want and and uh, it's important that caregivers get take care, good care of themselves for all the reasons and said thank you thank That's you really somebody else i want to hear somebody else's perspective okay lillian good afternoon um i work in phoenix arizona with family involvement center and we run a support group called circle of hope what I teach the grandparents, first of all, is I'm a grandmother that is on this journey right along with them. And that connects them immediately in most instances. And then I share with grandparents <coughs> the importance of asking for help. Right now, a lot of the grandparents I work with this year have really been challenged with grandchildren being online, not knowing computers, not paying attention, <coughs> making sure that they um, complete the assignment. If they leave the room, you better come back and check on them to make sure they're on that school page. So it is modeling. We do a lot of role playing. Um, but I've been on this journey for 22 years. My oldest grandson is uh, high functioning autistic and still at home with me. So I'm still on this journey. But that connection is we're on this path together. Nice, nice. Got another um, thing that I'm going to ask y'all to do. So here's what I know. How many of you, well, before I ask you my question, how many of you are familiar with um, Generations United? Wow, nobody's raising their hand. Oh, well, Gina, no, you don't count. because You found out from me. <laughs> um, so no one seems to know about Generations United. Have you ever heard of the Grand Voices Network? Wow. We're getting a lot of no's on, on that. And there were some other comments and we did have a hand up from Jill Richardson earlier, Dr. Claire, just to let you know. So let's hear from Jill and I'm, I'm gonna ponder what, what I, I need to ask you. I, I just, it really resonated with me, your comment about um, telling a, a parent caregiver or a, you know, a relative caregiver giver rather um, that they're modeling that behavior on how a youth will learn to take care of themselves in the future. Because I think caregivers are so focused on that child, they don't, they, they always think to themselves, well, no, no, it's not about me. But yes, it is about you because you're modeling that future for that child. And I thought that that really resonated with me. Yeah, you know, what, what really got to me was, um, <clears throat> The day that I recognized that my child studied me. I mean, she knew me better than I knew me. Yeah, better than she you could ever. tell a facial expression or if I did something with a particular hand. She, she, she knew. And she, was, she had studied me. And I, I realized then what I didn't know until then is that I guess I knew, but I really didn't know that children do study you. And so everything, it doesn't matter what you say. It matters what you do because they're paying attention mm -hmm. to it. But here's the thing that I need to share. <clears throat> so I know um, Gina who's on board because Gina is a part of the North Carolina Child Welfare Family Advisory Council. Long story short, in North Carolina, they got an advisory council of different kinds of parents, birth parents, former foster care youth, um, kinship parents, foster parents, adoptive parents, and they, um, they serve as advisors to our child welfare system in, in North Carolina. <clears throat> when I was going through my experience as a grand family person, the head of a grand family. I was looking for support. I needed a support group. I needed, I, I needed to talk about the things that I was observing that I found nowhere. Nobody in my world seemed to understand the things that I was doing. So my child, my child, um, her mother used drugs. She, from what I understand, and I didn't know all of this because I lived in another state. 
you know, and when you don't live right there with all your family, you don't know. And even when you're right there, you don't know all their business. You know what they choose to tell you. So her mother was a substance abuser. She'd been in and out of prison. Her mom, her grandma had adopted her, I'm told, when she was pretty young. That didn't stop the hole in her heart. She had lots of behaviors. And when she came to live with me, slowly but surely the different behaviors came out. The most profound one for me, the one that had the most impact for me, um, was the fact that she was Her hands went places they didn't need to go. She took other people's possessions. Um, I remember the first time it, it, I, it even dawned on me that this was happening was because her teacher contacted me and said something was missing. And I said, well, why are you calling me? And then I went and looked in her backpack. So I didn't have no reason to look in her backpack before then, because if you know there's something in her backpack and I needed to ask her about it, I'd ask her, um, can you give, I wanna see your, your school, your homework or whatever, and she'd get it out of her backpack. I had never been in her backpack before. And I found, mm, found all kinds of jewelry in her backpack. There were necklaces, charm bracelets, earrings, all kinds of things. And I'm thinking, oh my God, was I going to tell anybody that? No. I mean, it's like, what? Was I going to go to the school and say, is anybody missing anything? Uh, do, 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 do you, do, are you missing a necklace or a charm bracelet? No, I'm not going to go and tell nobody that. I'm not going to tell people, you know, that she is occasionally very upset with people. And she is kind of the bully at times. I'm not gonna, I needed to, I needed a place where I could talk about those things. I needed a place where I could go to get suggestions, something. And so I was looking for some places and I couldn't find any. Now I think, I can't remember who it was. Somebody had said earlier that, well, they um, provide a support group. Anybody else providing support groups for grand family? Okay, so I got, I see three or four hands. There aren't a whole lot in my state, North Carolina. We got a hundred counties in North Carolina. You know how many support groups there are here in North Carolina? And it's for the whole state. There's less than four. In a hundred counties. So that means they're not there. There is a need, part of the reason that I have come to this workshop is because my belief is that just like there is family partners, parent partners, there's a need for grand family partners because other people don't know about them other things. And as a parent partner, you're not dealing with those family dynamics that are going on. So the fact that my cousin, the first cousin, I had the second cousin, second cousin, she, she cursed me out. And, and, and you know, I was kind of hurt because I had custody of her child because I loved her and wanted to protect her child. That, that it kind of hurt me, you know? I've got... Um, Peers, I think I shared with y'all. I'm not sure because I've been talking for a long time now. Here. Yeah. So um, I asked y'all about the Grand Voices and Generations United. So here's what happened for me. Let me give y'all Dr. Nice Harris, for this. Yes. Uh, Gina, many, uh, again, tons of really great comments, uh, but I did want to make a mention that Gina did just share Grand Voices website information as well as Generations United on the chat box for anybody who may not have been. You on know, she's a resourceful girl. You do know? I'm so glad she's always here. So here's the deal with Grand Voices. There's pluses and minuses with Grand Voices. I, I'm going to be honest. Um, 
I was looking for a support group. I was looking for resources. I just happened to be presenting at um, a CASA conference about something completely different and um, saw something about grandparents raising grandchildren. And I said, oh my goodness, those people may be able to get me to this support group. And I connected with them. And that was the first time that I started to get some of my needs met mm. um, as a person that was raising a relative's child. Had no clue. Still, even with that, what I think I found out about that in 2008, in 2020, um, 2008, I think in about 2014, 14 or 15, I found out about Dr. Joseph Crumpley. Oh my goodness. I found out about Dr. Joseph Crumbly and I started thinking, oh, the stuff that I thought was going on, was going on. Oh, this is why I'm having these experiences in terms of my child loving me and hating me. Saying I have a, you're, you're, you're just like my mother. You're not my mother, <laughs> you know? Having the, um, her mother spit at me. Saying I stole her child and I'm thinking, stole your child that she, she's going to foster care. And we wouldn't be having these problems that we having if you just pick up the phone when I call. Didn't know those things. Dr. Crumbly helped me to see some of those things. I keep progressing. I have recently learned more about what's called um, family group decision-making. Now I put my own spin on it, but when I took my cousin to live with me, I needed to put some things on hold. <laughs> I, I, I moved too quickly. I needed to have called in my biological village and our family friends for us to have some discussion about what was going on. Because number one, I told you, Family tell you some things, but they don't tell you a whole lot. I didn't know what I had put myself into. I was being, you know, y'all, y'all, are y'all familiar with that song? We are family. I got all my sisters with me. I was singing that song at my aunt's funeral and said, oh, we are family. We're going to work it together. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to take legal custody. No, <laughs> there was a need for some intervention before I did that. I didn't know that. There is a need for those of us that have this experience to come together to develop grand family peer support services. I've also found in the last six months, I would say, that there is another need. <clears throat> so I asked some of you to raise your hand earlier if you were raised by a relative. And quite a few of you did raise your hands. There's always more than one way to skin a cat. So yes, we do need peers to work with grand family members and let them know, oh, you're not crazy, I understand. And be able to give them examples of why you know, because you've, you've had these experiences, you get it. But the kids also need that experience. Yes. Dr. Claire, there are some questions that are coming up. We're trying to uh, find Dr. Crumbly's website, and I think we do have it at HTT. Uh, oh, I just lost. Sorry. Uh, so Dr. Crumbly's website is not the best route. 
what I would do is I would go to YouTube and um, find Dr. Crumbly. Dr. Crumbly has a book that I don't have in this room with me um, called Relatives Raising Relatives. Um, there's a need to look at that, but he's got some excellent YouTube videos. Um, I had the great pleasure. I know I, I, I embarrassed him to no end. So I met him last August. Um, I don't know if you all are aware that um, in August of last year, there was a meeting in DC. It was um, called, um, it's a national advisory group. It was a convening, the initial convening of the um, grandparents raising grandchildren advisory group. They are actually supposed to have input and um, some decision-making ability as it relates to the Family First Prevention Services Act. Cause you know, <clears throat> so uh, that the intent of that legislation, which um, Generations United was very much involved with, was to involve families, grand families in and outside of the child welfare system. The, the, the intent was to get services for both, knowing as I shared with you all earlier, that out of 20 children living in a grand family, only one of them is in the foster care system, which means 19 of them don't have no services, no help, no nothing. So the intent, the original intent of that legislation was to get some services for them. That was the intent. Now, you know, a lot of things are intended. What I know in my state of North Carolina and I, Gina knows I have kicked and screamed and yelled and but I'm trying to be diplomatic. <clears throat> um, bottom line is child welfare system, and they're hard pressed, they got a hard job to do. But the kids outside of the system are not their problem. However, those children will be their problem if those families disrupt because the grand families don't get the support that they need. They don't get the respite. They don't get help with finances and all of the stuff that they need, they may very well have some children come back into the system and then they'll pay attention. However, a lot of them are not paying attention and a big money went out to try to get this to happen. Um, there's a need for us to do more um, conversing so that we can, um, so that we can put our heads together and start thinking through things. So I know in my state, and I'm gonna ask y'all to raise your hands if this is true for you. In my state, North Carolina, um, peer, I mean, parent, parent peer support, family partner support is going to be a billable service as of July of 2021. Is that a billable service in your state? So I see some head and I see some saying no, and I see some saying yes. No, so it's we, not. So we need to work to do that. I'm getting ready to put my email address in the chat. Please do. So that's my email address and it takes more than love is um, my Facebook page. Already liked it. Thank you. So there is a need for those of us who have lived experience in this area to come together and develop programming across the, 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 the US 
It is troubling to me that nobody here has heard of Generations United and doesn't know of the Grand Voices um, Network. Who's that person that just spoke up from Phoenix, Arizona? Did you know about the um, Arizona Grand Family Summit? No. That they just had on September the 26th? Oh, no, I didn't hear about that. Gina and I was there because I was talking about trauma in grand families. There's a need for us to figure out how more of us can come together oh. to develop these services so that we can help ourselves and our children so that we can figure out how to have our services as billable services. to make that happen. Now I will tell you about one thing that I know that I'm going to do and you all are welcome um, to participate. Um, in fact, if you don't mind, you can be my test group. I am a part of, and you can bring, uh, let me put that in here too in the chat. <clears throat> so I'm a resiliency educator. At I put too many S's in here. At Resources for Resilience. And one of the things that we are going to start doing, and I specifically am going to do, is to have, and Jeannie, you're going to be involved in it, just so you know, because I haven't told you yet. Um, well, you do know. Um, developing grand family listening circles. So it is not always, you know, right now, we, we, we're kind of stressed. We got a lot of stuff going on. We can have um, listening circles, which can last for about an hour, where people can um, reset their nervous systems and learn some skills to reduce stress. Folks got a lot of stress going on right now. Somebody was just telling me about all of the issues that she has in terms of this... Um, whole thing in terms of teaching um, her child online and she's not a grandparent. Um, she's actually 30 years old and she's like, what the heck with all of this stuff? Um, this, these listening circles can help you to develop a skill where you can be on the internet with 10, 15 people and help them learn some skills and they can just come back once a week. You can learn, I can teach y'all some skills that y'all can use and you can just come on once a week. And if y'all will let me um, connect with you all to see if you do it once, once you get the, um, an understanding of how it's done and let us evaluate it, um, what you do, what you learn, because here's the thing. How many of you know about evidence-based practice? Evidence-based practice is based on people teaching um, people how to do something and then evaluating its use and seeing if there's been any effect to it, if it's been effective in any way. We don't do that a lot. And um, I see a lot of people on here that look like me. We not involved in a lot of stuff. I see some people that don't look like me that have brown or yellow skin or red skin. We don't do a lot of that. We need evidence-based practice that's focused on us. That's how you get it done, is by teaching people a skill and then setting up some guidelines and then um, moving forward to um, see what happens with that. So let me get back to my PowerPoint, because golly, we got a half an hour more to go and I just um, killed a lot of time. First, before I say anything else, what are y'all thinking? What are you feeling about what I'm saying to you? Don't everybody speak at one time? Uh, my, name is, uh, my name is Crystal Mosley from Allegheny Family Network here in Pittsburgh in mm -hmm. uh, Pennsylvania. And on a personal note, I am totally, totally glad that um, 
this discussion is happening. Um, when I took in my grandchildren, two, two of my grandchildren, I still had children of my own I was raising. So um, the disruption in my home was darn near immediate. Yeah. And um, it would have been nice if I had um, a, a, a grandparent connection <clears throat> to, to assist me at that time. Um, it, was, it was really traumatic for my, for my youngest child. Um, it, it was just, oh my God, it was traumatic for her. Um, Cause they came in with services and, and, and they came in pulling, pulling the, her mother away from her. And it, so it would have been nice if I, if I would have had um, a grandparent circle to connect with. Um, because raising grandchildren is totally different than raising your own. Yes. Um, so yeah, I, I, I was so under so much stress. I lost, um, I lost my hair. I had dreads so all down my back and, um, the stress of, of just trying to maintain my, my family and trying to maintain my grandchildren and trying to maintain my daughter who wound up in a mental institution. It was just a whole, so much, my, my, the stress was just, it was just bad. So I, I'm glad that this conversation is happening and I'm glad that people are sharing their stories and resources. Um, I really wish I would have had somebody. somebody. Now remember I said now, if you needed to have some extra noise, you got to turn off your mic. Uh, somebody, whoa, whoa, I'm not sure who it is, but somebody I, got to I turn off no their idea. mic. Uh, James, James, you know, Rick James, and they got yes, Rick James, James and might be Marie. You. Now, it was interesting music, James. I'm not going to critique your music, <laughs> but we can have it here right now. Okay? Okay, keep going. <laughs> but I'm just saying that it, it would have been um, uh, uh, so instrumental to my, uh, to raising my grandchildren. Cause, uh, like I said, Cause you raising, loved them. You wanted them to be there, but uh, you wasn't ready for all of that. I, I did not want my grandchildren to be wound up in foster care. And if they would have wound up in foster care, they would have been separated. Mm -hmm. So it was either my grandchildren being separated in two different foster institutions or them in my home. Right. Them in my home with my, my, with my, Two younger children, well, my children, they're, they're all within four years of each other. My my children and my grandchildren. And it was just, it, it, I'm just glad this conversation and resources are being, are being shared and the stories and are being And you know shared. what? And people need to hear that it is okay to have those feelings. Of course. Because I, I, a lot, there, there will be some that'll say, well, they're all in your family and you should have just, no. But, These but, are people that don't know. And you have a right to the feelings that you have. Right. So thank right. you for sharing that. And, and stepping outside, now that I'm on the other side of, of all that, it was okay to feel the way I was feeling. It was okay for me to be straight. That was all normal. That was norm level of normalcy. You it know what was. I mean? Um, but in the middle of the thickest stuff, how it was in the thickest thing I couldn't see. Right. Because I was in the thick of it. You know, so I'm glad that people who may be in the thick of it are getting resources, and I hope that they pull on the resources and 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 and, and, and um utilize them. So there's a need. There's need a it. need for us to really get the whole picture, so that we can share that knowledge, that exactly. understanding, have that exactly. Um, and, it's, and it's okay to look out for support, even for those who are professionals, quote unquote. It's okay to look for support. Yes, because it is. It, it's because you may be a professional in one realm, and when stuff gets in the middle of your own home personal life, it's a total different whirlwind. And what is and, that and, saying, Doctor? Um, don't yeah, treat yourself. Exactly. <laughs> And, and yeah. people don't, and they think they know, but they, they, they can't see. They can't see because it, it's just too much. You know, they can't pull on it because it's a lot. So, right. doctor, don't treat yourself. Go find somebody to help out. 
Go find somebody. In fact, that's 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 doctor in front of your name. I don't care if you got uh, uh, what unless you got after your name. Seek out that support. Exactly, Doctor Claire. We do have four o'clock right now, and they're also uh, speaking of support. There was a Brenda Donaldson ahead has been um, sharing some information that's happening in Tennessee and asked to share. Can you can you share that information, please? Brenda, are you able to share? I didn't read it. What was it specifically? Oh, I see Brenda Donaldson, you had written in Tennessee. We have a relative caregivers program that is funded through the Department of Health Service, Human Services, excuse me. It provides supports and resources for grandparents, aunts, uncles, cousins, et cetera, that are raising children and youth. And then later on, I believe you had mentioned uh, sharing that. Am I correct? No, I don't think so. I think I was reaching out to um, uh, Dr. Glenda to see if we could have conversation on how she could share some of her information uh, to help us move a little further in Tennessee. We have the Relative Caregivers Program, and it's most effective in the urban areas, which are only three in, uh, or in Tennessee. Uh, we have 95 counties, all the rest are very rural. They are funded to serve those areas, but it's kind of uh, one of those things where they tend to say they can't find the people or the organizations to carry it out. So the ball gets dropped. Yes. But, uh, the funds are there for the entire state. And I work in, this, in uh, the state office for children, young adults, and families in mental health. And we're always getting questions and uh, requests and needs for supporting relatives and especially grandparents. We have a system of care grant right now, get ready to go into another one. And we have so many grandparents in these rural communities and relatives also who are just kind of um, out there lost and alone. Exactly. And, you know, you kind of know when it comes to funding, uh, urban communities absorb it. They have uh, more people um, and probably better access and, and they just don't dwindle down well and sit well in our uh, rural counties and they're suffering. And, and you know, now here's the thing though that I think is interesting in terms of my state, North Carolina, um, this is the place of my residence. I'm actually from New York State, but um, the best grand family program in our state is ironically a program that is up in the mountains, very rural area where four counties got together child welfare and senior care and they pull together a program in that area that's the best one best funded one in our entire state and remember i told you there were less than four in our state i put i think we lost the volume Glenda, you muted yourself. Oh, my apologies, Dr. Claire. That was I was trying to make sure we were getting rid of that background noise, and I believe I ac accidentally muted you. Thank you. Okay, because I was gonna say I didn't touch nothing. Nope, that was me. <laughs> I just everyone okay, happened well, to be muted right now. So if you do want to speak, just unmute yourself because we were getting some background. I'm not sure where it was coming from. Okay, so um, did y'all hear me talk about the rural county in um, the rural area in North Carolina that is the the best funded? Y'all heard that. So what I was getting ready to say, oh, and it is four o'clock. Um, what I was getting ready to say is, if you're willing, email me. Let me know if I can add you to a list that can be shared in terms of talking about some of these issues, in terms of doing some training, in terms of brainstorming with one another because we need services and we need to be paid for the work that we do. We do, we, we need to get paid. You know, the volunteer stuff? Number one, the volunteer stuff is not effective long-term. And these are long-term issues that we need to 
get funded for, continue to get funded for, show that we can develop some evidence-based um, programs that are really going to help families and then make it happen. Can anybody else give me a thumbs up on that? Okay, well, it is 5.05. Any other questions that y'all have for me? Because I've been talking a long time here. I didn't even get back to my PowerPoint. It's okay. I didn't get into the African-American, Latino, Latino, um, Latin American, and the Native American issues. Long story short, Native American populations, there are some things in terms of recognized and unrecognized tribes. There are some things in terms of who has jurisdiction in terms of the, the children and keeping their culture intact. Latino population, we know that there are some people that are deporting people like crazy. In terms of the um, African-American community, we've got these, in, these issues in terms of having our needs overall met in terms of not being recognized for our humanity. Um, the issues in terms of there are more, a lot of people that are being killed that look like me. They're unarmed. The destruction of families, I think that's happening across the board. The drug use, it, drugs don't care what color you are. <laughs> they, they don't care. Um, incarceration, yeah, there's more incarceration amongst the African American and Native American populations. Um, so there's a lot of different issues. Um, and not enough time to discuss all of them. So more comments, more questions, more. I hope y'all will get back in contact with me. And definitely like my page on Facebook. I'm reading. So no, now Eileen, I'm not taking your job. What, what are they saying in the chat? Oh my goodness, there are so many good things. Yes, so there are, um, uh, Cheryl Calloway said there in Michigan, Wayne County, there's an annual grandparents raising grandchildren conference and it's held this year virtually uh, November 20th. For more information. information in the chat about that, in yes, the chat, put that in the chat. That's at 4.05 p.m. That comment came through with the link to it. And Sonia Brown said, what we do not know can cause great harm to the family, educational laws and regulations on challenging behaviors and mental health. The children have mostly been overexposed to adult situations. Most have trauma. So being trauma informed and training in how to parent children with trauma. Um, uh, there, uh, uh, briefly, there is a qu uh, request at 402 to complete the evaluation for this amazing session. And there was a question, Dr. Claire, regarding will this be, will these slides be available for, for you? Or can we see them? Or I believe we are being recorded. So if you send me an email, I can send you some information. Thank you, Dr. Claire. Thank you. I've enjoyed this session. Thank you so much. And I'm so happy to know, where were y'all when I was going through this? <laughs> How come y'all weren't in my support group? How come y'all weren't pulling us together? That is my commitment. I know what it was like for me and I don't want nobody else having the challenges that I had. I stepped up because I wanted to have my cousin with family. I wanted her to be okay. And I could have been better if I had had some support. And so I want families to get the support that they need. And so thank you. And Stephen, I got to give you an extra clap because you're the only man in this group and we need more men to show up. Yes, we do. Okay, so we're looking for you for um, instruction, Eileen, because my clock says 509. So does that mean we have Oh, we, we, I see that we are uh, a 4.30 end and that we were going to have a 4.15 check-in point, but I, I think we do still have some time if you have more, if you have more time, Dr. Claire. Dr. Well, Claire, um, can, this yes. is Irma Clay. I don't know why, but my camera is not turned off. However, I don't see myself on the screen, but nonetheless, that's not important. Um, I think that this session has been truly amazing. Thank there are you. so many of us that are raising our grandkids. Uh, my granddaughter is going to be 17 next month. 
she's been with me since 11 months old. Wow. And it's been awesome. It's been challenging. It's been hurtful. But I think that um, the higher power knew that I needed something in my life at that point. Um, I think I was 37 and um, 63 now. And so anyway, it's, it's been quite an experience but it's been an experience that even though we've gone through changes or whatever, I think that all of us who make the decision to take care of our grandkids or our relatives' kids or whatever the situation is, um, that we grow stronger and we enhance their lives. And I think that that's the most important thing. So I'm going to stop now because I'm getting emotional. But this and is I really agree big. with you wholeheartedly. A great Thank you, Irma. I agree with you wholeheartedly. Wow. The issue for me is that when we don't get the support that we need and we burn out and it hurts us and it hurts the children too. Excuse me really quick. This is Gina. A um, couple things. Um, in Michigan, Cheryl, I'm not able to get that Franklin Wright org link to work. It came up with something else, I believe. And um, Teresa Wright Johnson, if you would put your email address in the chat for that. Yeah, I wanted to thank you. This, I'm going to show y'all this because um, Gina put, she says she put it in the um, in the chat, but I'm going to bring up the page because I just want y'all to see it. Okay. Thank you, Rhonda. Okay. Okay, yep, this is something different. Thank you. I was able to get to the mission. Do y'all see these people's faces here? Yes, we can so see. So these are supposed to be um, the members of the Grand Voices Network. Whoops, that's not the best picture. Let me go back. There should be one in just about every state. And you all should be getting in contact with them as well, asking them, what are they doing in your state? Do y'all see my pictures now? Yes. Yes. So you see Keith and you see Carol and Jeanette and look and see if you see your state. Stop at Maryland for a second. Okay. So Sonia Begay, who is in Maryland, is also um, a member of the Navajo Nation. She works for, I think she works for the Department of Health and Human, DHHS, I think that's Health and Human Services in um, the DC area. Sonia is also a member of that supporting Grandparents Raising Grandchildren National Advisory Council that I mentioned to you all before. So Sharon is, mm -hmm. I mean, Sonia is, Sharon is also from Minnesota. She's also a part of that network. Um, we'll go on down to the bottom. Dr. Claire, we have 15 more minutes. But see now, now I gotta figure out how I wanna deal with this. Okay, <laughs> okay. Um, so then, you know what? I'm going to take y'all on a resource tour. So I'm going to finish with this. Can, can you Grand Voices Network. Yeah. Huh? Is that where you wanted me to go at the bottom? What did Tennessee if Tennessee was on here? Tennessee is definitely on here. Let me see. I'm curious. But there's no picture. 
There's no picture, and I don't know Crystal Purdue. I'll sure find out who she is. Um, now the person from Phoenix, there's a couple of people because you know Gina and I know that that Arizona is um, they are trying. So you got Sherry and Victoria from Arizona. This woman Gail Engel is from Colorado. She's also on that um, supporting grandparents raising grandchildren support group. I resigned in June of this year, hoping to get some new blood and some more people to help me in North Carolina. And so you'll see two new faces on North Carolina. But this page, let me see, let me see if I can put it. Gina, is this the page that you put in the chat? Yes, it is. Okay. So I'm going to take y'all on another tour. So here's something else that I'm going to take you to. Hold on. There's a question about Oklahoma or Pennsylvania being on the list. And I'll, I'll look it up on my phone and get that information back. I've okay. Because I'm finding more resources for y'all. I don't you know about them. <clears throat> Pennsylvania is a Christine Benzelman and a Joanne Clog C L O U G H and a Ray uh, Renee Crosby Skinner, Tawana Harris, um, Tasha Kill, um, all from Pennsylvania. And what was the okay. other? Sheet? Okay, oh, so oh, now can y'all see this new sheet that I put up? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. These are grand family fact sheets. So we got a national fact sheet. And we got one for every state in the union. Let me show you North Carolina's. So on this fact sheet, you'll be able to get from the last census what the numbers are of grand families in your state. Okay. You'll also get some information about some resources in your state. So this is a good resource to have. Um, what I would do if I were you, because I know the North Carolina one is out of date. I know the one that has been principally sending in the information to update it. Um, I would go to um, Generations United, let them know that you're interested in the information, let them know that you want to get updated information. Resources. Take you to some more resources. <clears throat> mm, do this a little bit differently. Hold on, let me take off share for a second. Can you put your email in the chat, Dr. Claire? Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, I only just put the general um, Generations United address in the chat before. I think there may be a couple of people who are in the audience right now that are Native American, so hold on. Do you all see racial equity toolkits featuring grand families? Yes. Okay. These are good resources. There's one for the Native American community. There's one for the African American community. As I was speaking to you all earlier, um, I had mentioned something about housing. 
So one of my, I, I guess I did a lot of stuff last year. So last October, um, I went to see the first housing development that I've gone to that was for grand families in DC, Washington, DC. And so um, I met the people who had created mm -hmm. it and the people that were actually living in the housing community. Um, I found out about this through Generations United. Um, one of the um, grand family members if you look on the list, if you went back to that list that I took you with the grand voices, Olivia Chase on that list, she's listed as the DC grand voices member. She actually lives in that community. Um, but there's a need for housing for grand families. That's also a way to help the grand families get some of the support that they need. So that's a resource that's also available. So Generations United has a lot of information on their page, a lot of stuff so that you can read and start getting familiar with things. Um, there's still a need to pull stuff together and to do something with it and to mobilize in various communities. So I've been sharing a lot of information are there any more questions for me? It's 521. Will, be, will we be able to get all of the slides that you've presented today? Will you be able to get my slides? Let me look at them slides. Let me see what I, what I had. Y'all see my eyes that I'm squinting is because I don't see quite like I used to. Um, let's see, adversity is not destiny. That's the presentation. Okay. Well, let me see what I can do about this. Hold on. If you want, Glenda, we can see if we can um, have Kelsey and Nicole send it, if that will help you. Okay. Um, they don't have this whole yeah. presentation because I have definitely updated it okay. since I last talked to them. You want to send um, it to us and we send it out? Is that okay? Do you want me to send it to you? That'd be cool. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Awesome presentation. Thank you. Dr. Claire, there have oh, been sorry. multiple, yeah. multiple conversations about how wonderful this presentation has been and how much people have gotten from it. And okay, Cheryl, so I'm going to say that again. Oh, my apologies. Cheryl Calloway also shared that the Michigan information. If we look at uh, time wise 419, Cheryl Calloway listed a telephone number to share. And again, Dr. Claire, there have been just many, many well wishes and thank yous for this. This presentation has been so well received. So now if I asked for people to join the team to help us create something that would go back into your communities, do I have any takers? Okay, you I see some do. hands going up. Good, good, good. You have good. Irma, you, to say. I can't raise my hand, but you have Irma Clay. I'll Got put you, it Irma. Chat. You have okay. you. Uh... That's good to hear. Okay. Because, you know, if y'all send me your email addresses, I'm going to use them. <laughs> I just did from Hawaii. Awesome. Oh, Hawaii. can I come to visit? <laughs> I was going to say, can you come to visit us? <laughs> yeah, that's what I was saying. I was agreeing to that. <laughs> uh, after COVID, though, because I'm not getting on yes. the airplane for that long. Yes, yes. And I can't drive there. <laughs> oh, yes, yes. <laughs> yeah, okay. Well, this has been wonderful. I'm going to share the PowerPoint with Tika, and Tika will um, share that with you. But I will also have it and, and some other resources that I can share with those people that email me. And I, I definitely will be talking about 
let's come together to do some training. Okay, Stephen, I hope you're on that list. Okay, you all have a wonderful day. Yes, I'm letting y'all out five minutes um, <laughs> early because I think I'm tired. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Mahalo, thank you. Claire. Thank you. Okay, such a wonderful okay. presentation. Thank you. Thank Everyone you all. Have a good rest of your day. Thank you all so much. Have a good evening. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Irma, thank you for your input. You're always awesome. <laughs> thank you, Tika. Yes. She, um, um, it, it was awesome. Well, yeah, she, she, she really is. And, um, she's worked really hard with the, um, grand families, you know. So email me. I sent you my phone number in the chat. Mm -hmm. So give me a call whenever you I think you she can. went off. I think Glenda's off, but um, don't I still have your information, Irma? I know I sent you my phone number in the chat. Um, it's 813- Eight, huh? 966. Wait a minute, do it again, Irma. 813-966-9666. Okay, but how you been doing otherwise? I guess we got to I've been it. good. I've been doing good. Yeah. I've been yeah. doing just fine. And you? Um, hanging in there. Busy. Oh, good, but, good, yeah. good. And I think um, I'll make sure um, she probably has um, everybody's contact info, but um, I'll definitely um, make sure I share yours with her because like I said, okay. this is her passion. Um, I mean, I think it's excellent and it's needed. And it it's was awesome. Yeah. Every, the whole thing was awesome. And I'm hoping that this will be a good venue for her because it'll be such a blessing. In, in yes, 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 yes. Because so I think the conference went really well. I'm really oh, amazed. One more day. Yes. Oh, I know we still <laughs> have one more day on Thursday. And I am looking forward so forward to when worrying takes over, helping kids with ADHD oh, yeah. and parents to overcome anxiety and build resilience. Yeah. I am looking so forward to that with Dr. Saline. Yeah. But um, give me a call. Off of I will, and, love. I will. Okay. As take always, care. You are a jewel. Okay. Thank you, sweetheart. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.